Hi, everyone. Welcome today. We're so thrilled that everybody was able to make it. My name is Amy Margulies, and I want to share my story of, breast, of being diagnosed with breast cancer. And 2019 was an impossibly uh, really challenging year for me. In April of 2019, I had gone for my first mammogram at age 40, came back, everything looked fine, everything was good. Bring us to, April, to August of 2019, and I was actually playing a game of Monopoly with my son and my daughter, and when I was leaning over to make a move, I, I held my chest, and I felt a, a large lump. And the reason that it was so top of mind for me is I actually had a very close friend of mine diagnosed with breast cancer two months prior. So I panicked. Um, I looked at my husband. I didn't want to scare my children and said, I, I feel something. And I went the next morning um, to the doctors in, in New York. Um, I worked at Google, so we had a uh, doctors right in the building, and I went right there first thing in the morning. She, the nurse said it did look suspicious and sent me right to the hospital um, to get uh, a biopsy and have it looked at. Of course, you know, the next week we were going on our usual annual vacation to the Jersey Shore. I was hoping that would take my mind off the waiting, which it didn't. Um, I was very anxious to get the results back. And I was, you know, next to the beach playing shuffleboard with my son again, and we li we like a lot of games. <laughs> we do we do have fun, um, and I was playing shuffleboard. Saw my phone ring, and I knew it was the call. So I walked walked away a little bit, and all I can remember is the nurse saying, "You know, your results are back, and you're they're you're positive." She started going on about the the type of cancer it was. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, that meant nothing to me at that time. Um, I tell everybody that this is something that you don't know until you need to know. I didn't know what doctors to go to. Um, I didn't know there were multiple doctors that you see. Um, it was just a very confusing um, time. Again, luckily, in some ways, my friend that was diagnosed a couple months prior to me um, had all of that already mapped out. So I said, give me your doctors. I started scheduling appointments. And um, it was actually, um, you know, during this time in August, we were also celebrating because a month prior, I found out we were pregnant with our third child. Um, so here I am in this year, April, everything's fine. First mammo, great. Uh, July, find out I'm pregnant. August, find out I have cancer. Because it's early in the cancer, um, you know, there were multiple, multiple hospitals, doctors that I went to. Um, I tell everybody it's so critical um, to ensure that you are getting different opinions, um, that your doctors are talking um, to each other. And, um, you know, I really, really pulled together a, a great unit, a great team um, that was looking out for my health. Um, and luckily, one of the doctors that I did see uh, specialized in young women with cancer who are pregnant, and she told me it was absolutely, we, we could have the baby, um, and we tailored my chemo, my radiation, and surgery, you know, in a, in a not usual path. We made it, we made it custom um, so that I could have the baby, I could do the chemos that were okay while you were pregnant, and then we did, um, you know, Herceptin and, and radiation after, as soon as the baby was out. Um, also during this time, as everybody knows, 2019 into 2020 was when um, the world was about to shut down and, and enter a pandemic. And during this time, um, you know, going in and out of the hospitals, I was doing all of my treatments by myself. No one was allowed in the hospital. And I'm, I had this horrible, horrible cough um, for a majority of my pregnancy. Um, it was painful. 
I went to different doctors. They tried all different types of treatments and nothing worked, only to find out um, when I went into the hospital, they had timed um, when I was going to give birth. Um, they were going to induce me so that I could continue my chemo schedule as planned. Didn't go as planned. I came into the hospital. Um, they COVID tested me, sent me home, and lo and behold, I was positive for chemo, uh, for COVID that entire time. And um, I ended up going into natural labor, had the baby with COVID in the, in the COVID wing of the hospital. And um, thank, thank God, she is a healthy little girl about to turn three next month. And, um, you know, I just, I do, I, I'm so passionate about, um, you know, sharing my story and helping others, especially, um, I, I, I focus on two areas, especially preventative, um, ensuring that we're living the right lifestyles, um, you know, things, things that will help versus um, that aren't going to. And then also, like I said, for me personally, that beginning period of just not knowing what to do or what's happening um, is such a hard time. And I've heard the same thing from many different patients that I've spoken to. Um, so again, I'm just really passionate about sharing my story, helping others, and really want to see, um, you know, how far we can we can evolve and um, and nail this. Thank you. Thank you for sharing Absolutely. your story. Thanks. Thank you, Amy, for sharing your story, for your courage, and also, you know, it's a reminder to all of us about the important work that we do and the importance of uh, the sector, the healthcare industry that we all work in. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Seema Kumar. I am the CEO of Cure, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this very special uh, evening. It's CureX, our signature series, which focuses on cutting edge conversations about your health. Um, we have a whole host of virtual uh, participants over there, so I just want to wave hello to all of you. And we'll get your questions towards the end uh, as well. And welcome, of course, to our in-person audience. Uh, before we dive in into our evening's program, and it's going to be a short but extremely stimulating um, set of conversations we're going to have, I want to invite up Jim, Jim Flynn, who is the managing partner of Deerfield Management and also the founder of Cure. Jim. Thanks, Seema. Uh, I just want to give a very brief welcome to all of you here at Cure and everyone who's uh, dialing in remotely. Uh, when something happens to your health, not a whole lot else matters, as you can you know, infer from the story that, that, that we just heard. This entire building on Park Avenue, 320,000 square feet, is all dedicated towards advancing health care and improving health equity. There are so many important uh, different issues, and I'm super excited about tonight because we're actually going to hit a whole bunch of them between Lori Glimpshire, who's going to be our uh, first speaker, and then our following panel. So welcome and enjoy. Thank you. I think somebody can take that from you. Thank you, Jim. And um, so it's now my pleasure to welcome uh, Laurie Glimcher, Dr. Laurie Glimcher, um, up to the stage. Let me give a brief uh, introduction. Most of you know who she is, but she's the president and CEO of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and she's also the director of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center and the Richard and Susan Smith Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Before that, she was right here in New York City as actually the Stephen and Suzanne Weiss Dean and Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell, and before that, Provost of Medical Affairs at Cornell University. She's a distinguished immunologist, widely renowned for groundbreaking work that she has done in promising areas of cancer research. And she, of course, uh, you know, has a distinguished career with membership uh, at the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, fellow of the American Association of, for the Advancement of Sciences, and president of the American Association of Immunologists. So in addition to her research, um, Laurie is actually a staunch advocate for many things. 
including cancer research, cancer care, equity in cancer care, uh, and also medical education and policy. And of course, as the first um, you know, female dean uh, at Weill Cornell and the first female president and CEO of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, no wonder she's also a staunch advocate for women in STEM and women in medicine. And so it's my pleasure to welcome up Dr. Lori Glimcher. Welcome, welcome to Cure. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. So you have a very unique vantage point. You're sitting at the helm of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and you, know, you can see sort of the landscape of where cancer is, is headed. And as you see the landscape, what do you think uh, is the promise for actually progress against cure for cancer? I think that the last two decades have been absolutely revolutionary. You know, back in the time that I was training, it never occurred to me to become an oncologist because at that point, you really couldn't do much for a, for a, a patient with cancer. That changed in, you know, as I said, two, two decades ago when it was recognized, and I have to say that Dana-Farber faculty were very involved with this, that cells turn cancerous when they have a specific genetic mutation, at least for adults, for children it's a little bit different. And so knowing that the genomics and sequencing all patients mm -hmm. who have a tumor, you can learn what their mutations are and then one can proceed, and you'll hear more about this from Eric Fisher, mm -hmm. to do drug discovery. Yeah. How can we disable that genetic mutation? And then I'm an immunologist, mm -hmm. and the second revolution mm -hmm. was the ability to activate the immune system. And you know, this goes back a long time, yeah. over a century ago, when William Coley, who was a surgeon in New York City, made the observation that when he removed a, t a cancer from a young man and the wound got infected, that, that that cancer did not come back. So he reasoned that there was something in the body, an endogenous system, which is the immune system, that while it's killing off an infection can sometimes also kill off tumor cells. And People worked for 100 years and couldn't get immunotherapy to work mm -hmm. until Jim Allison discovered that you could activate the critical cell mm -hmm. in the immune system, which is the T lymphocyte, which is something that I focused on for many years. And uh, when Gordon Freeman, who, was a faculty, who is a faculty at Dana-Farber, discovered a second inhibitory receptor, which was called PD-1, PD-L1, and that just changed the whole landscape. Now, we can treat people now mm -hmm. successfully. About 25% of them respond to immunotherapy, and it's only about 10 to 12 specific cancers that can respond at all. So pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, very serious diseases that are almost uniformly lethal, mm -hmm. do not respond. We call them cold. So we have a long ways to go, yes. right? I want it to be 100% of patients that respond to immunotherapy. And you know, I, I want to say really right away is that academic medical centers cannot do this themselves. Yes. We do fundamental science. Gordon Freeman discovered PD-1 because he was looking for something specific. We can take it just so far in academia, yeah. depending on how well-funded we are, which we are very well-funded at Dana-Farber. But at some point, the best things for our patients is to collaborate with industry because industry can do this all they're not necessarily known for making you know, Nobel laureate mm -hmm. <laughs> discoveries. Yes. Mm -hmm. Academic medical centers gen generally do that, but they do know how to develop drugs. And so 
I like to say that the DNA of Dana-Farber is really collaboration, not competition. That's fantastic. That's really great. And in fact, Dana-Farber, you have 50% or so focused on basic research and 50% on, on clinical applications and clinical research. And the two are working in collaboration. So the bench to bedside part is very important at Dana-Farber, isn't it? Absolutely, and that's what is actually quite unique about Dana-Farber. I don't know that you would see this at any other hospital where 50% of your faculty are researchers, brilliant researchers. The clinicians, and I didn't realize this when I first came to Dana-Farber, I, I knew a lot of the researchers at Dana-Farber because I was at Harvard just down the street. Um, what I didn't appreciate was how incredible the clinical care is at Dana-Farber. Um, I, I get hundreds of letters from patients and sometimes their loved one has not survived, yeah. but they say the, the care here was so exceptional. Um, you gave him six more months of life and the nurses and the physicians were, couldn't have been better. So, but the important thing is, and again, I think this doesn't happen in every academic medical center, is that the clinicians can't wait to help the scientists. So when we talk about bench to bedside, it's also bedside back to bench. We do 1,100 clinical trials at Dana-Farber a year. And, you know, I remember when uh, one of our faculty recently discovered two new inhibitory receptors. Mm. Yeah. And he saw that they were expressed at high level in the brain. And the first thing he did was to run down the hall and talk to the clinician who treats patients with glioblastoma. It turned out that this inhibitory receptor was present. Mm. They started working together, mm -hmm. founded a company, and are doing phase one clinical it's fantastic. right now. It's so it's phenomenal. because there's such a mission there. Just, it's all about the patients. Yes. You talked a little bit about immunotherapy, and of course, Jim Allison won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for you know, some of the work he did. And, uh, and you said only 25% so far you know, the, the, of cancers we can treat. What remains to be done for, to get to the 100%? whether it's through immunotherapy or some other means? It's fundamental science. At that level, you are looking for novel targets. And at Dana-Farber, we look at not novel targets by many means, screens, so whatever, you, what, whatever we need to do. And then we do preclinical animal models. Mm -hmm. We can now use human organoids. And, that, and so I would say, we have a very robust pipeline. Mm -hmm. And then we have a terrific department of chemical biology, which is chaired by Eric Fisher, who's mm -hmm. here this evening. Mm -hmm. And so we can get tool compounds mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. Look at that in preclinical mm -hmm. models. We look at it in organoids. Mm -hmm. And so we can come to a certain point, and indeed sometimes we can actually make a drug. Yeah. And again, I think you'll hear that from Eric. Yeah. Um, but Eric, of course, is closely allied mm -hmm. with Deerfield mm -hmm. uh, and the Center for Protein Degradation, which is doing extremely well. So again, colla you know, collaboration is what we should be doing and not competing with each yeah. other. We need to come together. And yes. we, we really have done, had, had a wonderful uh, experience with Deerfield. So that public-private partnership and the academic-industry partnership is really important. Um, what other breakthroughs that are, are you excited about when you sort of look across the landscape of scientific advances, things that you're saying, okay, that's going to be the next big thing in cancer? Well, if we want to take advantage of President Biden's cancer moonshot reignited, even though it doesn't have any funding yet, Recently, he has just asked for $3.5 trillion for it. The chance of him getting it, I think, is fairly small. But, you know, his goal is within 25 years, Produce. we will have a reduction of 50% mortalities in cancer. Yes. And 
we will bring in historically underserved communities because you know we all believe that any patient with cancer deserves the finest care, cancer care that they can get. And we're, we're working a lot on that at Dana-Farber. We have established some satellites with physicians and nurses and so forth that are sit in underserved communities. Yeah. I, I can expand yeah. on, on, on the other things that we're doing in cancer equity. But this is, this is a top priority for Dana-Farber. Yeah. We'll come back to cancer equity in a minute. Um, do you think the goal, question, yeah. What are the mm -hmm. other, yes. you know, uh, that I'm so excited yeah. about? And honestly, you know, right now when people come in because they have symptoms, mm -hmm. and at that stage, things aren't always as good as they were for Amy. Yeah. Where you found the lump, it hadn't metastasized, and you're cured. But 75% of people, of the 14, pe 14 million people that get cancer every year, by the time they come to us, the cancer has already spread to other organs. And you know, we sometimes can cure that, but it's much more difficult. So another of our top priorities are early cancer detection, yes. prevention, and interception, because if we can, you know, we could cure cancers 100% if we could detect them early enough. Yes. So why has detection been so hard? I mean, when was it that we declared war on cancer? A long time ago, and we, yeah, we're still sort of seeing patients who are coming in in the later stages. Well, I think that's because all of this is fairly new. It's how can we, detect small cancer cells, a small number of cancer cells in the blood or perhaps in the urine. Mm -hmm. And both uh, industry, companies like Grail or Thrive, mm -hmm. and also academic medical centers, we're doing this at Dana-Farber. If you can detect a few circulating cancer cells or cancer, center, uh, cancer tumor um, DNA, mm -hmm. which is even more sensitive, at an early stage, <laughs> then you, the, you could, you're hopefully you're gonna be in stage one. Yeah. But, you know, we focused first on high risk patients. Yes. And what does high risk cancer mean? Well, aging is a big mm -hmm. issue yeah. <laughs> of cancer, unfortunately, as we get older. Having had one cancer increases your risk for a second cancer. Mm -hmm. Some lifestyle behaviors. Obesity is, is probably gonna supplant mm -hmm. tobacco mm -hmm. as a major environmental hazard. Wow. And um, inherited cancer. People don't realize that 10% of cancer is genetic. It's inherited. Mm -hmm. So once, once, for example, there's a, there's a syndrome called Lynch syndrome, and it's present in one in every 284 people. So it's not uncommon. And it's due to a collection of about five genomic mutations. So it's called Lynch syndrome. And so now we have developed at Dana-Farber, how do we get to these people? So whenever a patient comes in with either colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, or uterine cancer, which usually are the tumors that stem from these mutations. Mm -hmm. We now assemble the entire, if this patient mm -hmm. has Lynch syndrome, mm -hmm. we get the whole family in, and I'm, I'm not talking about just nuclear family, I'm talking about cousins, uncles, family. aunts. Mm -hmm. We get them all mm -hmm. in and we sequence them to see if they have Lynch. So at least the rest of the family, okay, they're gonna have colonoscopies every six months, nobody likes that, yeah. but it's a lot better to detect it early than to come in with metastatic colorectal cancer. And this is particularly important now because there is an alarming incidence of cancer, of colorectal cancer, in young people, I have seen and got, gone, gone by and, and said hello to 
a number of patients, 30 years old, 40 years old, completely healthy, and they come in and they have metastatic colorectal, colorectal cancer. Why is that? Do we have any? We do not know, and that's why it's so important, because here's where the fundamental scientists come in. Come in. Is it metabolites? Is it the microbiota? Is it uh, inflammation? Is it what you're eating? Yeah. Is it, you know, we don't know yeah. what it is yeah. yet. Um, and we have to figure that out. And we are fortunate to have the, fac the research faculty that is working on that. Because until we figure out <laughs> why you develop colorectal cancer when you're 30 years old and a, he a healthy individual, until we know that, we're not going to know how best to treat it. We can only hope that more pe people do get colon colonoscopies. Um, the, the FDA lowered the age when you start from 50 down to 45. I think it should go down to 40, frankly. Mm. I've told the two of my kids mm -hmm. who are 40 and over, get a colonoscopy. Yeah. You don't need to miss this. Yeah. That's, um, you know, we've been talking about detection, cures, treatments. Um, what about prevention? I think prevention is critical. Yeah. Um, and again, we need to reach out to everybody, not just to people who are necessarily well-educated and, uh, and know where to go. Um, we could prevent a lot. For example, inherited, uh, to go back mm -hmm. to inherited cancer, BRCA1, mm -hmm. BRCA2, 40% of, um, one out of 40 Ashkenazi Jewish women will have the BRCA mutation. Yeah. And we need, to do, we need to figure that out right away. Yeah. So we have offered at Dana-Farber for any Ashkenazi woman, come in, we will check to see if you're BRCA1 or 2 positive, and then we will follow you very, very carefully. But wouldn't it be great to actually prevent even an early onset of breast cancer or ovarian cancer. And that's really where I think early detection comes in. One of our faculty members is working with the UK and um, is studying from the blood hundreds, thousands of women who have BRCA1. And he's following them mm -hmm. to see what can I, can I find something that tells me that this patient is going to develop breast or ovarian cancer. And yeah. he has found a microRNA mm. that may predict that. Wow. That's, but there's that's so much more to do. So much more to do. Yes. Um, and in the meantime, we are dealing with, with, with care, cancer care. And there, the, the big challenge is equity, you know, care equity. You're passionate about that. Tell us what some of the challenges are in cancer equity. There are so many to mm -hmm. overcome. And I'll just tell you some of the things that, that we are doing. One of them is putting satellites mm -hmm. uh, in, in communities that are very, very diverse. We have one in Foxborough. We have one in Merrimack Valley. It's very diverse. We also have a group of, of uh, we, have a, we have a foundation of cancer equity. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is that people are not as educated as they could be, mm -hmm. and we need to get out there, and we are, to communities, to churches, to whatever, to talk about cancer. Mm -hmm. And we've also removed the financial barrier mm -hmm. um, of coming to a place like Dana-Farber. Boston Medical Center Deal, it had, deals with very, very diverse patients. Mm -hmm. And we have an alliance with them now. Mm -hmm. We have patient navigators mm -hmm. at Boston Medical Center. They don't really do clinical trials themselves. So what we do is to, the patient navigators could explain what is a clinical trial because 20% of our patients, actually the best option is a clinical trial. Yeah. But you have to explain what a patient trial is and get people comfortable with it. Yeah. 
and then we bring them over, mm -hmm. put them on the clinical trial. But the other thing is that people want to come into a hospital that looks like them. Yeah. And so we it's focused thing. intensely mm -hmm. on recruiting more faculty, yeah. more staff yeah. who are people of colors. Yes. In 2021 and 2022, working hard at it, and I met with so many uh, candidates mm -hmm. uh, that wanted to come to Dana-Farber. And I met with them because the, the first one that I did that to said, gee, we're, the CEO doesn't usually talk to somebody who's coming in as maybe an assistant professor, mm -hmm. but it worked. Mm -hmm. And in both 21 and 22, over half of our recruits were people of color and 80% were women. That's excellent. Now, we're, we still have a mm -hmm. long ways to go. Yes. But that you know, encouraged me that we were on the right place. We need to increase the percentage of people of color in clinical trials. Yes, and, and you know, going out to communities and recruiting communities, I mean, do, even during the COVID-19 vaccine trials, this was a big issue because, you know, trust is a major factor going into communities. Um, it has to be people who look like you, right. who you trust, who, you know, can, can um, actually work with you to, to recruit you, but also to, you know, whether it's collecting samples or what have you. Um, which brings me to, you know, the next generation. You talked about, you know, the next generation. Um, medical education. Uh, and when you think about medical education, and you think about creating a diverse community of doctors and nurses, um, what do you think the challenges are there? Do you think given where healthcare is and all of the challenges that we will continue to attract the next generation and a diverse, you know, group of candidates to medical schools? So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done with nurses, yeah. oncology nurses. We have an alliance with UMass Boston, and they train nurses. They don't train them to be oncology nurses, and it's very, very diverse. And you know, some of these young women and men, they can barely afford being at UMass Boston. Mm -hmm. and they don't get, get um, specialized in onco oncological nursing. And they often just, they have so many other things to worry about, putting food on the table, taking care of their kids, that they sometimes can't get through the boards. So thanks to a gift that we got, our chief nursing officer, who is absolutely passionate about this, started bringing in, them in we, it was cost us about $200,000 per nurse, bringing them in, helping them pass their boards, teaching them how to be onco oncologic nurses, and then keeping them. Yeah. And it's a, it's a pipeline for us, mm -hmm. and we, we had a wonderful gift recently that allows us to triple, actually, yeah, triple the number of interns we can take in. So that's Great. one thing we do. The other thing is we are now the, the alliance um, for the Boston VA. Mm -hmm. Again, a very diverse group of men and women. And again, um, because of a gift from the Prostate Cancer Foundation, we are able to go there, look at their, their prostate cancer patients, and if they are suitable for a clinical try, we, can, we, we, we bring them in. Yeah. Um, we have committed, we're in the middle of a capital campaign right now with a goal of $2 billion, and we have allocated $50 million of those dollars to cancer equity. And, you know, we are already at $28 million, and I think we're going to, we, I hope we can go over to, to $100 million. Yes. Well, good luck with that, and that's, that's great. Uh, last question before we take audience Q&A, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, you being a role model as uh, the first female dean here in New York City first, and then now being the first uh, president of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, what is your message to, to women in science, and do you think we're there yet in terms of uh, getting to equity well, and I gender parity? <laughs> I would say we're not there yet, but we're a heck of a lot better than when I was a, an intern um, or a resident yeah. 
uh, after, after graduating from, from Harvard Medical School. I, I, I won't even share with you some of the things that were said, but you know, the, the HMS class was 21% women, 80% men. There were 25 of uh, us interns, and only three of us were women. Mm -hmm. Um, we would go on rounds and the attending would look at the male intern and the male resident and, as if I were not there, <laughs> wasn't even there. Um, things have become much better, but I have found with women that they need to have more self-confidence. Even if you don't feel self-confident, pretend that you are. And speak up for yourself. I mean, I have people coming into my office, mainly male, who say, I think I'd like a, a, an increase in my salary. <laughs> They're almost entirely male. <laughs> Very few women come in and say, you know, I, I think for the following reasons, I think you should increase my salary. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's, as I say, it's far better than it was, but um, we also have to recognize that women are usually the primary caretakers. Yes. And I know what it's like to be basically a single parent because my first husband was a transplant surgeon mm -hmm. and really was almost never home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and a lot of people can't afford mm -hmm. to have live-in babysitters. That's right. And maybe you don't have your family. I mean, some of the, <laughs> I, when, when women say to me, what would you recommend? I say, if it's possible, live near your parents <laughs> because there's nothing like grandparents to take care of your kids. As yes. I have now learned, yes. taking care of, of my grandchildren, grandchildren, despite the fact <laughs> that I have a 24-7 job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they say grandparenting is easy. Maybe it is. I'm sorry? Uh, they say grandparenting is easier than being, you know, being a parent. So. Yeah, um, but it's also you're, you're older by that time. And you know, there's a reason why women have babies when they're young. <laughs> because rushing after a toddler who's gonna get into everything possible to try to hurt himself <laughs> is not exactly restful. Uh, Laurie, what's your personal moonshot? You know, it is preventive vaccines. Now, right now, at Dana-Farber, one of our faculty members has developed a, can a therapeutic cancer vaccine for melanoma. It's personal it was personalized to eight people who were on death's door, basically. Mm -hmm. wow. Widely metastatic melanoma. Mm -hmm. They hadn't responded mm -hmm. to chemo. They were not responding anymore to the immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And she made an individualized, personalized vaccine from the tumor of each one of those. Hmm. Now it's several years later, six of those eight patients are alive. Wow. With very little, they maybe, maybe have a little melanoma, but they're fine. Wow. So she's now made Incredible. personalized vaccines hmm. for Renal cancer, we're in clinical trials with that. Glioblastoma, which is a very difficult tumor. Mm -hmm. Ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Pancreatic cancer. And we'll see how they go. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, always going to be combination therapy. Yes. You're going to want to have a vaccine plus immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. Yes. You put them all together. Yeah. But, you know, I think, because when I look at my small grandchildren, wouldn't it be fantastic if one day they could go to the pediatrician and have a vaccine that will prevent cancer? And look, I think it's doable. Yeah. I mean, after all, you know, the East Coast developed COVID mm -hmm. vaccines. Yes. If we can do that, we're all sitting here without masks. And yeah. we're sitting here without masks. In person, And yes. um, if it can be done for viruses, measles, mumps, rubella, which we all get, tetanus, it should be able to be done by, for cancer. 
Well, thank you very much. I want to just turn to the audience and see maybe we have a minute or two to get a couple of questions. Oh, wow, we have a huge amount of questions from uh, from the audience here. Let, let's first look at the in-person here. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Could you introduce yourself? Thank you. <coughs> My name is Wilson. Um, I work on knowledge networking. Uh, fun fact, uh, MIT and uh, Carnegie Mellon are doing research on collective intelligence. Uh, instead of individual intelligence, collective intelligence, and they find out that uh, other than social perception and diversity, presence of women increased collective intelligence substantially. So that would be good news, and that would make you know <laughs> women ask for more payment. Uh, my question is, in terms of collaboration, you said there are issues in collaboration. What are the issues in collaborating? Like, is it because of the incentive structure that it exists that hinders collaboration between universities, industry, government, and civil society? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear no. that. Uh, what, uh, why is the collaboration between universities, industries, governments, and civil society so hard? Are there incentives lacking uh, for so the collaboration? Hard? Yeah. Well, for one thing, um, academic medical centers are under threat. Uh, my guess is that academic medical centers, the number of them will, will disappear because it's very hard to support fundamental research. Um, you know, we get more money from the National Cancer Institute than any other cancer center, and yet if we did not have philanthropy, we would not have been able to have 50% of our clinicians, 50% uh, of our researchers doing fundamental science. There's, you know, to me, the, the, it used to be solely focused on your own career, and it was competitive. You wanted to, to beat out somebody else who's working on the same project that you are. I think that has really changed over the last few years, partly because, um, you know, we, we are, uh, I mean, Dana Farber has launched at least 60 biotechs in the last decade or so. And I think, you know, to me it's obvious, right? If you're, it, what's the point of working so hard day and night if you don't collaborate? Because the patients come first. And it's, you benefit the patients by sharing your data. and. You know, we, we actually established with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering the genomics because we're all doing genomics. Well, let's put them all together. So we have like 18 cancer centers that are donating all their genomic data from their patients. And that gives us a huge number and it allows us to say, well, now we have a, we have a, a, a drug that targets this specific genetic mutation but we don't have enough, it's rare, so we don't have enough patients with it. Now we can say, oh, but Memorial has some, and NYU has some, and so forth, and then we can do a clinical trial. I'm not sure I answered your question because I only heard the last bit of it. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I, I think the incentives, uh, I think the incentives is, a, you know, first it was competition, but Collaboration is, uh, you know, incentivizing the collaboration is going to be important to do more of the same. Speaking of which, I think the, we have many questions from um, our virtual audience, and this one that's up on the screen, is Dana-Farber connected to any hospital in the New York area? Yeah, I just mentioned Memorial Sloan Kettering, but, but we, you know, researchers don't care what institution is what this institution is, they want to bring in researchers, scientists that are working on the same thing they're working on and come together. So they don't care if it's New York, if it's Kansas, if it's next door. Mm -hmm. Re you know, scientists, I can tell you, 
uh, when I ran a big lab, I mean, I used to reach out to people all over the world to say, gee, you know, I, I saw your paper and it's really interesting and I have an idea. Can we talk about it and we, could, we can do it together? So that's scientists, you know, so they'll, they'll go Agnostic anywhere. Agnostic to location. Agnostic to location. Location, geography, they, yeah. You know. Another question, you have had a very successful career. What would your advice be to your younger self now as a woman in science? Well, um, <laughs> remember you're going to get old. <laughs> so <laughs> take advantage of every day. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Do not give up. You know, if you're going to be a scientist, you better recognize that 90% of your experiments are going to fail. You're going to get some of your grants rejected, rejected. and your publications rejected. But you got to, if, you, if you're really passionate about what you're doing, you just keep on doing it. But the other thing about women is, you know, you have to put your money where your mouth is. It's fine to give people emotional support, but it really comes down to, for women, because they have bigger burdens than men do, you know, if, if you have a, a, an assistant professor or a, the, the assistant to the professor is really where we lose women mm -hmm. because they have young kids. Yeah. And you know, if they've made a discovery, do they really have time to write a grant, to wait for the NIH for eight months to know if you're gonna get it? So I have raised a lot of philanthropy for women. We have a really interesting one that, I, that actually I, was the first gift I raised when I came to Dana-Farber was with the Helen Gurley Brown Foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got them interested in pairing female postdocs in the labs of senior mm -hmm. leaders, mm -hmm. assistant yeah. professors, as well as uh, senior professors. Now that, that worked out so well, mm -hmm. and we, so we paid for their salary, mm -hmm. that it's been expanded. So now, every year we have 10 postdocs going into the laboratories of mentors, mm -hmm. female mentors. Mm -hmm. And we've created a whole culture of the old women, mm -hmm. as in the old boys. Yeah. <laughs> That's you, great. I mean, you, it, but you do have to recognize that, you know, they need more funding yeah. than they're getting. And they're not asking for it as much as men will do. And there are so many ways, because uh, uh, the, the thing that I think we need to do is not just bring women into science, but to actually keep them there, correct? Yes. Because it's a leaky bucket. Yes, and because you know, the, the ratio of graduate students is a, still about 50-50, maybe even 60-50, 60-40, uh, with women, more women, stays 50-50 as your postdoctoral fellow. Assistant professor, you're getting already 60-40, and the real thing is, but you, but you get an, a package when you come in of funding as an assistant professor, and once that's over, yep. then you know, then it comes the tough time. You've got to raise grants, et cetera, et cetera, and that's where we lose women is between the assistant to associate professor, um, and 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 that's what we have to and 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 we actually enlarge the Helen Gurley Brown uh, to do another project, which is we call Trailblazers, where we take women at that stage and give them quite a lot of money. Yeah. It's the infra infrastructure needed to really support them through that particular right. you know, valley, if you will. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today and um, you know, for sharing your, your experience, your wisdom, and, uh, you know, and uh, good luck. Thank and you. Thanks for all the work well, that you do. We want to make cancer go away. And next up, we're going to have a panel discussion, and we're going to take the conversation about the cancer moonshot broader. I'm going to talk about actually moonshots in the broader sense of the term. So I'd like to invite up our panelists, and we're going to have 
somebody come and set up the chairs here for us. And please come on up. And I will first like to invite Dr. Greg Petsko. And he is a professor of neurology at the Anne Romney Center for Neurological Diseases at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, working on Alzheimer's and other neurological diseases. Dr. Rick Bright, former head of BARDA and the CEO of the Pandemic uh, Prevention Institute at Rockefeller, former CEO, I should say. Dr. Eric Fisher, he is a director of the Chemical Biology Program at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I think if you could sit over there. And he's also the uh, director and founder of Civeta Therapeutics and Neomorph. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And as I said, we're going to try to take this conversation a little bit broader. Um, and the first question actually is for you, Greg. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you about neurological diseases. And you make a convincing argument that in the next 50 years, with an aging population and people living longer, that there is a tsunami coming at us. And that's in the neurological diseases, in Alzheimer's especially. Talk a little bit about that and why we should be prepared for that. Thanks, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. When I was born 74 years ago, there were about 1.2 million people in the United States over the age of 80. There are now 15 million people in the United States over the age of 80. And within the next 30 years, that number will grow to 35 million people over the age of 80. About 40% of those will develop dementia. Right now, there are about 6.5 million people in the United States with dementia. By the time we get to the middle of this century, that number is going to be somewhere between 15 and 20 million people. And think about what that means in terms of a percentage of the pop. That's more than 10% of the population of the United States is going to have one disease. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of terrifying. Yeah. And the cost is astronomical. We spend about $200 billion right now on care for Alzheimer's patients. We've tended to prioritize care rather than cure. Mm -hmm. All right, so your, your, your name of a cure, cure is exactly what we should be focusing yes. on, but we don't do that. By the time we get to the middle of the century, that's gonna be a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars on one disease. No healthcare system can withstand that. So you call it a tsunami, that's exactly what it is. It's a tidal wave of astronomical proportions, and it's not just going to hit the United States. It's going to hit most of the world. Yes. Because in, for the last 20,000 years, the population distribution of the world has been a pyramid with a large number of young people who are healthy at the bottom taking care of a small number of old, sick people at the top. In many countries now, that pyramid is a column and in some countries, it's already started to invert. Yes. And if we get to the point where we don't have enough young people to support the large number of old people, the Ponzi scheme that we call life mm -hmm. is going to break down. Yeah. So, I mean, it's frightening. But, what, what, what do we do? Well, there are three things that could work. Mm -hmm. One would be global thermonuclear war, but I don't particularly <laughs> advocate that. Another would be a pandemic that made COVID-19 look like a mild summer cold, but I'm not advocating that either. There's only one thing that's going to work. We have to make that large part of the pyramid of older people. We've got to make them healthy older people, not sick older people. And the only way to do that is with biomedical research and pharmaceutical development. Without those things, we're cooked. I'll come back to you uh, on that question and about you know, finding cures or even treatments, if you will, uh, for Alzheimer's and other you know, diseases of the aging. But Rick, you were in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, in the middle of Operation Warp Speed and at the height of the crisis. Um, but somehow, 
people came together, and you know, here we are. Um, what worked, and what what were some of the challenges? Well, there are many challenges. I mean, make no mistake about it, Seema. Um, this was probably one of the most devastating things that we have faced in our lifetimes in terms of uh, consequences to health, uh, life years lost, uh, economic yeah. disruption, societal disruption. Um, one of the most disastrous things that we could ever imagine. Um, however, there are many good things that came out of it. Many, there's a silver lining. Mm -hmm. And some of that was the ability to accelerate biomedical sciences and development of a vaccine in a record time. Instead of taking 10 to 12 or 15 or 20 years to develop a vaccine and, and put it in broad scale use, it took 10 months. Yeah. Therapeutics as well, monoclonal antibodies. People don't give monoclonal antibodies that much attention, but look how fast we had treatment options specific to this novel pathogen that we hadn't seen before. And yes, in the United States, we were delayed in implementing diagnostics and testing, yes. but the people developing diagnostics actually moved very quickly, but they were hampered by the regulatory process and government bureaucracy to not be able to use those diagnostics. So what was impressive was to see if we open the floodgates of innovation and that the scientists and the academic labs and the small biotech companies and the large pharmaceutical companies, and we also encouraged, as we heard earlier, collaboration. Um, companies collaborating with companies that were former competitors. Um, the, the biotech collaboration with the large pharmaceutical and how we brought in the government collaboration to conduct larger clinical trials move faster. You can see what would happen, what did happen. I think one of the greatest challenges that we face going forward yeah. is learning from that. Yeah. You know, there is so much exhaustion that I think the biggest risk we face today is complacency. And, and the thought that, wow, we, we got through it and we're fine and let's package all that up and put it away. And we're seeing funding dry up. We're seeing innovative things and authorities like telehealth mm -hmm. being put back in the closet with um, different rules and regulations that's gonna hamper its use. So we're, we're, we're seeing, regressing back to pre -pandemic. We're regressing. Yes. Uh, and that's a big challenge. How do we keep those floodgates open? How do we keep the innovations that we use to bring these novel medicines to more people and increase access and, and address um, access to healthcare through telemedicine and, and move diagnostics into the home? And how do we keep that momentum and keep those doors open? And when we make a vaccine for cancer, it doesn't have to be a 10 or 15 year or 20 year endeavor. If we have the right science, why can't we get it there in 10 months or, or a year or two years? Those are the types of things we need to, lessons learned from this horrible crisis. And the phoenix coming from these ashes will be accelerated approval of new drugs and diagnostics and vaccines that are gonna make us healthier in an older age. Do you think, you know, where we are today, uh, if the next pandemic were to hit us, let's say, even in five years, that we'd be ready? I think if it were to hit us in the next year to five years, we'll be worse off than we were going into 2019 COVID pandemic because yes. of the exhaustion, because of the, the, the mentality that we need to now close the doors, shift our attention somewhere else and, and stop funding these critical areas. I mean, um, Congress is not funding the development of next generation vaccines the way they should. They're not funding the development and discovery of novel therapeutics. And what's been heard in this process is are the amazing platform technologies that we leverage to make monoclonals quickly or to make um, vaccines faster. So those are ripe for acceleration into the next generation and building these platform-based technologies. So we're closing the doors. Um, we're not funding the sciences. We've had such a brain drain in our government scientific offices. We've had a brain drain and a loss of uh, workforce in our healthcare workforce, our nursing workforce, our doctor's workforce. They're, they're so exhausted and there's so little respect and appreciation for the crises that our healthcare professionals went through 
that many of them are leaving the field and, and they need a break. Yeah. And so if something were to hit in the next near term, I would say one to five years, we're going to be worse off. Trouble. Yeah. But we can fix that. We can reverse that. We can focus on that and make it not as bad as it could be if we acknowledge that, take a sober look in the mirror to see what we did wrong yeah. and, and, and fix those things and sustain them so we're better prepared for the next one. Speaking of novel therapeutics, um, Eric, um, what are some of the big opportunities uh, in that arena? I mean, and also, what are the challenges? Uh, first in discovering them, and then in bringing them to market quickly. I, I mean, there are multiple here. I think taking you back to the, what, what Laurie described in, at the very beginning, we, have, we learn a lot more about patients. We sequence every patient. We learn about mutations. We learn about the genomics of cancer, but we're not making therapeutics that target those alterations in the genome. In the end, we have to understand how does it translate to a change in the body's function? How do protein structures change? What are things we can intervene with? So we need to have an atomic molecular understanding of, of the biology. Only then can we start thinking about making therapeutics, and historically, We've been quite constrained in how we were thinking about therapeutics, where we would think about kinases being druggable, transcription factors being undruggable. Mm -hmm. I think we're breaking down this paradigm mostly through basic research and, and discovery. Mm -hmm. We're now thinking more out of the box. And I give you one example from work I've really been involved in, where we try to understand how the, every cell in our body constantly turns over proteins, right? the composition of a cell is a very specific mix of proteins that changes all the time because proteins get damaged, mm -hmm. get newly made, changes over the cycle of a day. Um, so our body has this intrinsic ability to destroy every protein. And, and if they get damaged, they destroy it. If you have this ability as a therapeutic, you could virtually erase the term undruggable because you could go, the body can go after every protein. Mm -hmm. So we've been studying this for a long time. And I think we're now at a point where we can actually make molecules that, at least in some cases, can redirect this endogenous system, very similar to the immune system. You re redirect it at a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. We redirect the intrinsic system that the body already has yeah. to eradicate the disease by targeting, targeting disease-causing proteins. And there are many examples like this. In the end, it's really mechanistic understanding to the most fundamental level that allows us to think about new therapeutics. And it's hard. Right? It just takes time. That's one hurdle. Yeah. And it takes money, and yeah. you fail many times on the way. Yeah. Um, how far do you think we are from you know, where we want to be? I mean, are we still understanding things at the mechanistic level? Do we feel like you know, it'll take us five years before we find like, the next novel therapeutics? I think one, one, one and that's often, if, if you talk to people about cancer, it's a big umbrella term. It's a million disease. Yeah. And, and so, we're making big strides in individual parts of it, but every single one is a big endeavor. And so it's not a five-year effort. I, I think we're making the, the pace of progress is incredible, um, but there's a lot to do. There is still a lot to do, yeah. So would you say that um, the field has, um, you know, is still in its infancy, or is it, is it blossoming? And when do we think, uh, what does it take to actually accelerate it, speaking of acceleration? Well, that, I don't think there's one field. I think what we really see is an evolution of technology. If you speak broadly about therapeutics, right, we have tools at our disposal that we didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. We have small molecules, we have antibodies, we have gene therapies, we have Gene added, we, we have a lot of tools, and we're starting to understand how to use these different parts, not dissimilar to using combination therapy, yeah. to think, what is the right approach? It creates, it does create an, a new challenge, which is sometimes I have five different ways to go about the same problem, and yeah. now I need to prioritize, and I need to figure out what is the right way to, to go about. Um, speaking of solutions, therapeutics, um, why is it that it's taken so long? Why is, why is Alzheimer's disease especially um, and neurological diseases been so hard to, to solve? Why are we focused on care rather than cure? Well, almost anything connected with the brain is difficult. Right? I mean, Woody Allen said, nobody touches my brain, they might drop it. Mm. 
And you do have to be very careful. Uh, there are things you just can't do with brain diseases that you can do with diseases of other organs. That's been a barrier. But also the complexity of the brain. I mean, it's mind-bogglingly complex. There are more cells in your brain than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So when you, when you think about that, that's certainly part of the problem. But the other part of the problem is the field has tended to focus on a particular therapeutic strategy to the exclusion of other therapeutic strategies. I call it the street light effect. Mm -hmm. you, you know the old story, guy's on the ground looking for his keys under a street light. Yeah. Policeman comes along and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. Policeman says, I'll help you. Where did you drop them? The guy says, over there in that dark corner. Mm -hmm. Policeman says, what are you doing here? The guy says, light's better here. <laughs> well, once you establish a potential therapeutic strategy, it's like turning on light, and everybody starts looking in the same place. We got to get over to the dark corner. Mm -hmm. That's where the answers are. But that's harder. It's harder to get funding. Progress is slower. And you tend to come up against paradigms that you have to overturn. All of those things are beginning to get better, but it's been a, a long slog. Um, Rick, what about in, in pandemics? Um, what do you think um, are sort of like the still remaining challenges that we could solve and be better prepared for, for the future? You know, I, I think some of the challenges are global collaboration for a pandemic. I mean, we have to take the element of surprise off the table. I think we, we need to recognize now that pandemics do happen. The pathogens are evolving. Um, we are at risk of a, an avian influenza pandemic um, any day. I mean, you can see H5N1 avian influenza infecting more birds around the globe. You can see more transmission of that spillover from birds to, to seals to, to foxes and, and sporadically even the people. And it's just a matter of time, perhaps, for something like that to um, adapt to humans just enough so it can spread effectively and cause significant disease. And then you have your next pandemic that you described and said, we hope we don't have. Um, but the challenge is that this, the strategies that the US government and those around the world have were written in 2006 and maybe updated in 2018. And they don't include the modern technologies that we learned about and utilized to get in front of the um, COVID pandemic. And so I would think that getting, we, we have tools today, we have the genomic surveillance, we can test water, we can test air, we can test people, we can test animals. Um, we can break down silos and, and, and sharing those data and so we can do better to develop a drug or a vaccine and diagnostics that can be better prepared and respond more quickly for the next pathogen that emerges. We have the ongoing threat of antimicrobial resistance. For example, um, more and more everyday bacterial organisms are becoming resistant to more and more of the limited arsenal of antibiotics that we have. And one of the challenges that I like to um, highlight is that much of the innovation coming from academic labs and small biotech for new antibiotics or new ways to address this I call silent pandemic of AMR, is those companies are, are starving. The, 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 the are developing new antibiotics and they're not being incorporated into our arsenal to treat drug-resistant bacteria, or they're not being re reimbursed at the same rate. Um, they're being reimbursed at a generic antibiotic rate of you know, pennies per pill versus perhaps the, the, the value that they bring to addressing those um, deadly pathogens, the value they bring to um, quality outcomes from a patient, the value they bring to reducing overall healthcare costs because you nip it in the bud with a diagnostic, you treat it appropriately, and you reduce the chance of an ongoing more severe infection, you reduce the chance of sepsis, you reduce the chance of someone dying. The savings in there must equate to some reimbursement value for those novel therapeutics, those novel antibiotics. We're missing the boat. So there are a number of growing threats. We are not responding to what we've learned and we're not fixing the system to be able to adopt and utilize that knowledge and to make sure that we have those companies in place 
and we have those technologies in place and we're using those to be able to realize those benefits that we have that's gonna help prevent another outbreak, either a pandemic from a novel emerging pathogen or something that's emerging among us and around us every day right now. I want to ask each of you one last question, but I want to take questions from the audience, uh, both uh, in person and virtual. Do we have any questions? Yes, I see one question from, is it Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for the, the discussion. Well, Dr. Glimpshire talked earlier about collaboration and the importance of industry, government, uh, academia, private sector in general. Uh, here I see you know, in traditional academia, I see maybe not silos, but columns of expertise. Uh, they all may be linked by phenomena that's associating age and disease processes. So the uh, risk factor for COVID was age, risk factor for dementia is age, risk factor for cancer is age. How do you start to collaborate these silos across your professional discipline so that you can learn from each other in areas and ways that you hadn't been able to take advantage of previously? Question. Yeah. I can start. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's less of a problem in neurology than it is in some other fields because we have nothing, right? I mean, th there's very little we can do for most neurodegenerative diseases except counsel the patients and their families. Um, and, and that kind of feeling of helplessness breeds a desire for a community. Right, because we're all looking for help. We need help in figuring out what to do. We need help in figuring out how to do it. And I, I think, therefore, the silos are less of an issue uh, in our field. The, the paradigms are an issue, as I mentioned a moment ago. Silos, not so much. So it's, it's somewhat field dependent, I bet. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think, si at least in my perception, siloing is that dominant. I, I think, quite honestly, from, from my own work and, and what I see around me, success of teams and, and, and kind of the size of the questions we are trying to ask requires you to work across disciplines. And so there's, there's enough incentive to work across disciplines. And, and I think at least I, I couldn't name a discipline I haven't interacted with. I, I think most of the colleagues around me do. So I, I, I think it's not always obvious, but we very effectively work across disciplines. Anything I'm going to just be a little bit of a contrarian because I think that the silos are surrounding us in, in public health and, and in basic research and pandemic preparedness, data sharing and access. I mean, one of the things that we've tried so hard to do for pandemic preparedness and response and surveillance and, and intelligence to be able to respond faster is to break down those silos. We have, um, for example, challenges in sharing or connecting genomic data with clinical data. We have challenges in collecting and uh, connecting data from one state to another state and from those states to our federal system. So we have those types of silos in place that are blocking the exchange of data and blocking that collaborative data sharing that we heard about earlier between different academic institutions or cancer institutions. And it's those silos that are slowing some of the development and progress down, slowing the awareness of the magnitude of some problems. And so one of the things I think is important to do in, in forming those collaborations and those, you know, I learned as leading an organization in government the value of public-private partnerships. Government alone can't solve these problems. Private sector alone can't solve these problems. Neither can academia. But we have to find that way to work together and share that information. That's the only way we could put Operation Warp Speed together and move as quickly as we did with the, the vaccine development for the pandemic response, was breaking down silos between government and the private sector, company to company, and bringing in the academic stage and sharing data. I mean, is it really about where do those data go? Who has access to them? Who owns them? And at some point, it becomes a, a greater cause for the greater global good than it does for, for a proprietary need for those types of data. And so it, it's critical that we form those public-private partnerships. And that was, I mean, again, I'll go back to the BARDA days. I mean, while I was at BARDA, we actually accelerated the development of 62 drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics to FDA approval 
in a 10 year time frame. More success in what we did through collaboration with public private partnerships than any pharmaceutical company in the world on their own without that collaboration and getting new drugs and vaccines and diagnostics approved by the FDA in that time period. And that was truly because of the value of the public private partnerships. I think we have one more question and then we'll do a last question and wrap up. Um, hi, um, everyone. My name is Kim, and um, I have a question for Dr. Bright. Um, so I'm just curious that behind all of their, your achievements, success, um, can you share a little bit what was your biggest challenge and how could you overcome it? Thank you. Could you repeat that when we see that? What was, your, what was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it during that time period of, you know, extraordinary success? For, for the pandemic? For the pandemic. You know, only I one, think only, I, only one biggest challenge. I think the biggest challenge was something we never prepared for, and that was political interference in a scientific process. So the politicization of a pandemic response, the politicization of science and putting politics over science was the greatest challenge because so many well-intended and educated and capable scientific institutions and biotech and pharmaceutical companies knew what to do. But having the pressure, the political pressure, dictate the pace or prioritize funding or prioritize um, the message around it really eroded trust in the public. And the erosion of trust is what um, put at a disadvantage the miraculous uh, medical countermeasures, drugs and vaccines and diagnostics that were developed at a disadvantage because they weren't incorporated, they weren't used, they were, the uptake wasn't what they should have been, it still isn't what they should be to realize the true impact and power of being vaccinated, of using testing and, and getting appropriate treatment sooner. So the greatest challenge I would say in the pandemic, something we never exercised, we had live fire tests, we had paper exercise, we have round table discussions, we never had the factor of political interference in the pandemic response considered. Do you mean Trump or what? I'm sorry? Do you mean, do you mean Trump? You don't have to answer it or you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I think it could happen under any administration at any time. I, I, I really, I, I do think that it's something that we have to factor in going forward. Um, there could be uh, political dissonance um, that may not work um, in harmony with the scientific knowledge. And one lesson learned that we have to put forward is the importance of letting science lead and putting science over politics and using the best science and scientific judgment to make decisions that are critical to saving lives and keep politics in the backstage. So we're going to end with I hope this will be positive answers. Um, so we've talked a lot about challenges, but we want to leave the evening with some solutions. So I'm going to ask each of you, what is your personal moonshot? So Eric, you want to start? OK. I have, I have many things I'm passionate about. I give you one that's a scientific one that I think we can achieve, yeah. and a personal one that I don't think I will achieve. So the scientific one is, I, I think we should really eliminate the term undruggable, right? We should not be thinking about something that we can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I do think we have the convergence of technologies from all angles, the experimental, computational, different approaches that will get us to this point at some point. The personal one I probably won't ever get to is climb K2 and ski down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, but you got to go for it, though. Right, Greg? Yeah, so I'd like to uh, agree with what Laurie said, okay? And not just because she's my wife, mm -hmm. although that's certainly a significant part of it, uh, but also because I think we've got to get towards prevention. Yes. And for the neurodegenerative diseases in the long run, we don't want you to even start to develop those diseases. And that's a really challenging task, but I actually think I know how we might get there. And I think what we could do is build a satellite onto the moonshot for cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you quickly why. 
Did you know that if you have Alzheimer's disease, your risk for nearly every cancer goes down significantly? Hmm. And did you know that the reverse is also true? That if you are a cancer survivor, and it doesn't matter which cancer or how you were treated, your risk for Alzheimer's disease goes down hmm. significantly. If you think about it, that means there's something in the one that is somewhat preventative for the other. And I think if we could develop a program to jointly look at that connection between those diseases, we might find a preventative strategy the likes of which we currently can't imagine now. Wow. And a personal moonshot? That is my personal moon. At my age, I don't have time to separate the personal <laughs> moonshot and the professional moonshot. What about being able to run after your grandchildren? Uh, I can do. I can limp after my grandchildren, <laughs> and at some point they'll get old enough so they'll develop arthritis too, and then I've got them right where I want them. Rick, you know I, there are so many amazing moonshots, and and I get to be part of you know X Prize moonshots and government moonshots and cancer moonshots and others, and and so I'm fully supportive of all of those. We need a cure for cancer, we need a cure for, we need a vaccine for HIV, we need so many of these challenges to be addressed. But my, my moonshot for health is, my greatest concern is that we have these cures, we have these drugs or vaccines, and people can't access them. And still today, people are dying in a hospital or at home and a cure is sitting on the shelf already approved, and there's this huge gap between having a cure, having a treatment, um, and getting it to people. And I think systemically we have these challenges, um, and you know we develop new diagnostics that can um, detect a, a bacterial organism and a drug that will work within hours now, but yet we still rely on culture-based assays that take three to five days. And, and in the meanwhile, patients are on ineffective drugs and, and their disease is worsening and we are worsening the problem with drug resistant bacteria along the way. So we have this systemic challenge of integrating new technologies and, and such as rapid diagnostics or using the right drug or, or using um, telemedicine or um, home-based testing and test to treat programs. So my moonshot would be in a systemic way of uh, breaking down some of those old barriers to be able to make sure that when we have a new technology developed and approved by the FDA, that it's accessible and that it's used. It's on the hospital formulary immediately instead of the three to five years it takes, instead of the three to five years it takes for CMS to figure out a reimbursement policy or an IPPS or an ITAP or whatever it might be. These systems are archaic and need to change because the patients are dying while they wait for this approved drug or, or medicine or treatment to get to them. And that is a big problem, I think, that would clear the way for all these other moonshots to be most effective. Well, thank you all very much for sharing your personal moonshots and also for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.